Welcome to Rising Stars, where Miriam Knight, publisher of New Consciousness Review, interviews exciting new voices in the world of progressive and transformational books, films, and ideas who offer intriguing perspectives on life, the universe, and everything in between. Join us as we celebrate the conscious awakening and explore many expressions of consciousness in action. Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Miriam Knight and I have my dynamic duo of reviewers with me today, Cynthia Sue Larson and Brent Marchant. Cynthia Sue Larson is the best-selling author of six books and they help people visualize and access whole new worlds of possibility. She has a degree in physics from UC Berkeley, an MBA degree and a Doctor of Divinity. Cynthia hosts Living the Quantum Dream on the Dream Vision 7 radio network. She has been featured on the Discovery Channel, the History Channel, Coast to Coast AM and the BBC. And she's presented papers at international conferences on science, spirituality and consciousness. Her website is realityshifters.com. Not to be outdone, we have Brent Marchand, who has been a lifelong movie fan and student of metaphysics. And his books, Get the Picture, Conscious Creation Goes to the Movies, and Consciously Created Cinema, The Movie Lover's Guide to the Law of Attraction, provide a reader-friendly look at how the principles of conscious creation and the law of attraction are illustrated through film. His blog on metaphysical cinema and other self-empowerment topics can be found at brentmarchantsblog.blogspot.com. Welcome, guys. Hi. Hi. Hi, Miriam. <laughs> we will you make start it sound with... so good. I always like that. <laughs> <laughs> but you are so good. You guys are great. And anyway, you're great, we're going too. To start. We need to, we need to uh, say something <laughs> yes. good about you, too. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So, Cynthia, let's start with your first pick. What is it? My first book is Cultural Perspectives on Mental Well-Being, Spiritual Interpretations of Symptoms and Medical Practice. This is by Dr. Natalie Tobert, and it's actually a really remarkable book for the simple reason that a lot of us, um, well, I haven't been through this myself personally, but I know a lot of people who have been through Western psychiatry where the the tendency is to rely heavily on me biological diagnoses, medication, and um, sort of prescribe you know, drugs, essentially. Mm -hmm. And what's happening worldwide, not just in the United States of America, but in the United Kingdom, where this author comes from, is that lots of people uh, are being treated differently with good results when consideration is given to the fact that there could be different cultural interpretations of symptoms, which means simply that a person might have, for example, a different um, background where they believe, um, like, for example, a system that's termed abnormal in America need not be abnormal in Africa because there, there are differences in psychiatry, psychology, and philosophy. And so a symptom of schizophrenia that um, we recognize in the, you know, the DSM are in Western psychiatry would be not considered that at all in India, but be per perhaps there would be a consideration there was a ghost or a spirit in contact because with the person. There are differences in psychiatry. And so and instead of assuming philosophy. just right off the cuff, so well, that's unscientific, that, um, what uh, we Dr. Natalie Tobert is recommending is to consider uh, just re respect for these different philosophical, spiritual outlooks. And, and then she cites a lot of excellent research that shows when that is done, there are better results overall. That, in fact, a lot of the very same uh, symptoms that people have for spiritual experiences, such as hearing the voice of God, hearing angels, and sometimes going through a near-death experience, an out-of-body experience, or an end-of-life experience, can totally trigger uh, things or episodes or experiences that if doctors in Western medicine are not aware of, could um, might be medicated at when they don't need to be medicated. Because some of these anomalous experiences 
are quote unquote good ones, and so they're not creating <clears throat> problems. Yet there's still a huge um, percentage of the population receiving medical care that are concerned about even telling their care- medical caregivers the truth of what they're experiencing because they don't want to be judged foolish mm-hmm. or insane. Mm-hmm. So it's a really timely book. And again, it's called Cultural Perspectives on Mental Well-Being, Spiritual Interpretations of Symptoms in Medical Practice. And there's a lot to this. So I don't know if you have well, any I'm specific so, questions. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad that is this is coming out because certainly within the framework of our listenership, there are so many people who have either had these experiences or and and even further written about them and it it really is time for this to come to mainstream acknowledgement it reminds me of the old joke of the psychiatrist (laughs) saying to his patient you are not paranoid people really do hate you right (laughs) and there's a serious side to this too when i said this is a huge book it gets into political impacts as well such as um, there's a pol- there are policies of forced adoption that had happened um, because of beliefs about pregnancy and sex outside of marriage, and that has changed, uh-huh. and then social pressures. And then there have been some issues related to some um, groups being mistreated by various governments in various countries around the world where mm-hmm. children are whisked away from their parents and that kind of thing. So this is a huge topic. I, I love the way that the author somehow brings it all together because it's just gigantic. It, it does touch on something I know we're going to get into later about <clears throat> children who are albinos who are not regarded as human beings in t- Tanzania, and mm-hmm. parents are encouraged to kill their albino babies because there's a belief that those babies were cursed and so forth. And so this is, um, I, I just, and then thalidomide comes up. Uh, this is a huge book. It's small, but it's big in content. And I think for anybody, I would recommend it very highly for anyone involved in psychology uh, and involved with dealing with people from different cultures or who just want to be aware of what's really happening on all these different levels. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I was going to go to Brent, but since you already brought up the uh, the subject, my book, uh, my first book is called Then She Was Born by Cristiano Gentili. It's translated from the Italian um, by Laurie Hetherington. It was originally published as Ombra Bianca, which means a a white shadow. And it is a novel about an albino baby who was born to a Tanzanian um, family, and it caused the husband to basically reject his wife the mother of the child, and the mother rejected the child. And the child was actually um, rescued by its grandmother, whose dark secret was that she had given birth to an albino uh, baby, and it was left to die. And she was bearing that guilt, and so she, she decided that she had to rescue this albino baby. And uh, she brought it up. and the baby, the child, was rejected by the entire community and was, uh, there were so many superstitions swirling around about what these zeru zeru um, could do. They were considered nobody, non-people. They weren't even given names. Um, The the novel is absolutely uh, unputdownable. In fact, I, I read it until four in the morning, much to my husband's annoyance. And um, it is a, a problem that is existent today. Although the novel is fiction, all of the uh, experiences in the novel, from the, the, the shaman to the chief of the village to um, even uh, people uh, that you would consider having a Western mentality still being drawn into the possibility of magic being associated by these uh, the body parts of these children um, are are absolutely true, and the novel uh, is uh, supporting 
a website and a charity called HelpAfricanAlbinos.com. And if you want to inform yourself or even help these uh, these poor children, there there are um, refuge villages that have been set up for these children, and they are supported <clears throat> by this charity. So again, it's HelpAfricanAlbinos.com. But the book is absolutely fascinating, just as a as a novel. And again, it's called Then She Was Born by Cristiano Gentili. So, Brent, can you lift the mood for yes, us? Yes, I can lighten the mood, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> well, my first, uh, my first movie today is uh, titled The Red Turtle, which was a recent uh, nominee at the Oscars in the category of Best Animated Feature. And what this film does is it, it follows the adventures of an unnamed shipwrecked castaway whose uh, vessel is destroyed during a violent ocean storm. When he washes ashore on a desert island, <clears throat> excuse me, he finds out most everything he needs to survive, but he really longs to return home, so he begins constructing a bamboo raft to sail away. But no sooner does he leave the island when the raft is destroyed by an unseen force from below, forcing him back ashore. This is a pattern that repeats two more times, and it's only and despite his efforts to you know reinforce the raft each time, but it's only after the third attempt that he discovers what's been the problem all along, and that's a giant red turtle. So with his hopes dashed, he returns to the island, but before long he finds that the turtle comes ashore to meet him, and he wants to exact revenge against the turtle for leaving him in this state. But what takes place next completely surprises everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, since we, coming up. <laughs> uh, absolutely, since we don't want to spoil the plot, it's called The Red Turtle. Okay, well, we're going to break, and then we will be bright, right back with Reviewers Roundtable. Your conscious lifestyle on steroids. Home Times Radio, IOM FM. As difficult as it is to believe, there are places in Africa where human traffickers sell albino children and their body parts for use in magic rituals. Humanity Healing International is actively working in Uganda to change this paradigm. The Albino Rescue Project finds albino children who are at risk and places them in safe schools and environments where they can learn and grow free from fear. To learn more or to sponsor a child, visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Hi everyone, this is Shay Parker, the host of Best of the Best, which airs live right here on IOM Radio every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific. I'm super excited to bring you expert guest hosts, spiritual discussions, free psychic readings, and so much more. I can promise that you will not want to miss this one-of-a-kind, fun, yet touching, down-to-earth show. Join us every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Pacific on OTRFM. This is Shay Parker, and I can't wait to see you there. I am Fidel Nshombo. I was born in a city called the Bukavu in the Congo. We were a loving family, and then, boom! Everything that I had disappeared in a single day. People think that when you are a refugee and they resettle you to America, you know, your problems are done. They don't understand that that's the beginning of everything. I was not born a refugee. I was made one. It's time we welcome refugee families with open arms. Learn more at EmbraceRefugees.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Welcome back to our Reviewers Roundtable. Brent, you were kind of cut off in midstream <laughs> when you were reviewing The Red Turtle. Do you want to just wrap that up? Yeah, I just want to add a few more things about it. Um, basically, this is a very beautifully illustrated film. It's very simple. There's no dialogue in it. Um, and it really gets into exploring some of the things that go on with the cycle of life that all of us experience, some of the universal experiences that we all go through during the course of our lives. Uh, but doing so through the context of living uh, life on a, on a uh, desert island. And um, it's um, not necessarily terribly profound or earth-shattering in that regard, but it's poetically presented with beautiful animation and um, gorgeous soundtrack and uh, just really a very entertaining film. The one thing I would recommend with it is it's, 
it's animation, but it's not really a cartoon. So if you have younger viewers who express interest in it, I would say if they're maybe younger than 9 or 10, they might get a little bored by it. Um, but anyone who is uh, certainly from that age onward, I think they'd enjoy it immensely. Beautifully illustrated, once again, it's called The Red Turtle. Well, living on a desert island really makes us focus in on who we are. In yes. essence, you could say that we are all living on our own desert islands and the challenge is to reach out and connect. So I, I can see that that would be very profound. Well, and, doing, and also doing so without the distractions of the, of the quote unquote outside world to exactly. keep us from doing that. Exactly. Okay, Cynthia, yeah. you're up. Awesome. Okay, the next book is called Stretch, and this one is, the subtitle is Unlock the Power of Less and Achieve More Than You Ever Imagined. And I love the way that we always have such synchronicity because you don't need to be on a desert island to get by with less. <laughs> so, <laughs> couldn't resist. <laughs> okay, so the key to this idea, this is a book written by Scott Sonenschein, and he really does an awesome job illustrating lots and lots of examples of how we can get uh, a lot more done with a lot less. And in some ways, there's an advantage to being frugal, not to the point of stinginess, but to be frugal. And I think the key here is, like, when, if, who hasn't experienced that feeling of if only when you're facing a situation and you, you get the feeling that if you just had more money, time, friends, people, power, that everything would be better. And then when you look a little bit beyond that situation, you extend this to a person's entire life, a lot of people start thinking that life would be a whole lot better if they had a lot more money, more resources, and so on. And so what I love about this book, Stretch, is that it shows that instead of chasing those kind of dreams, people who really end up feeling happiest with life, and some of them are millionaires and quite wealthy, rags to riches and all that, is that they not just survive but find ways to thrive with the kind of limitations that some of us might think would handicap a person. And mm -hmm. this can create a lifetime of success, skills, and ability. And I'll just share a couple of ideas from the book. One is diversification, that when you benefit from the breadth and depth of more skills, interests, passions, and expertise, then you can find the unification amongst all those many hats you're wearing and end up with an amazing story, such as the person who ended up fixing the Hubble telescope was not just an engineer, but he was a surgeon who had been doing surgery just a couple of weeks before he went up into space to do that repair. And so if you love rags to riches stories, Stretch is full of them, yeah, it, from the movie maker who created the film El Mariachi on a budget of $7,000 that went on to earn over $2 million at the box office, and he did it with very little, to beer maker Dick Jungling's business, thriving by keeping costs down, by purchasing factories, equipment, and market shares at bargain rates. It, basically, this book is just full of these fascinating case histories. Most are from the business world, but I think it's an excellent book for anyone seeking success, either in their work, their career, or just life in general. And I love the way that these people in this book come from many walks of life, so it doesn't seem like it's just people in business or just people in the movies, but it could be anyone, anywhere. And the, the, the skills, the life skills that are pointed out can start helping just regular, everyday people like you and me start feeling like, wow, I've got some limitations? Awesome. I'm going to really rock this. So I love it. The book is, again, <laughs> Stretch. <laughs> Unlock the Power of Less and Achieve More Than You Ever Imagined by Scott Sonnenschein. Oh, Cynthia, we are so in sync because... My next book is called The Seven Keys to Surviving the Trump Presidency, Dr. Calm's Prescription for Healing Post-Election Stress. The author is Dr. Kiran Dintiala, and he is known as Dr. Calm. And he talks about post-election stress disorder, uh, and he started uh, focusing on this because he kept on seeing high blood pressure unrelated to diet and exercise during the, the you know, um, 
campaign and up to the election. And he ended up dubbing it Trump retention because people are really, really stressed out. And I know from just from my own circle of friends that there have been deep divisions even within families of people who have diametrically opposed political views. And he has these seven keys to how to reconnect with your own inner calm and restore peace to your relationships. Um, they range from practicing presence to acceptance, just accepting people for who they are, allowing them to have their own opinion, and then moving on to what unites you as family, not to let that uh, impede your relationships or even impede your own peace of mind. He talks about how to practice calmness and even-mindedness and gives some exercises on how to uh, instantly or within you know three to five minutes restore your own sense of calm and to remember that uh, your thoughts are what your reality is what you're thinking about how you're thinking and that if you purposely turn off the news um, think when you're having negative thoughts stop it focus on something positive and let that kind of rinse out the the troubling streams that have been going through your head um, how to overcome uh, mood swings and and most importantly to empty your mind before you go to sleep so many of us are watching the news in the evening or listening to the radio first thing in the morning. And what immediately bombards us is the latest outrage, the latest um, conflict or um, lies or inconsistencies. And it, it, it's a turmoil. What, whatever side of the spectrum you're on, you will find something to be outraged about. So let it go. Remember that we have had these before. We will have them again. Life goes on. Find your own center of calm and focus on that. And your life and the world around you will be much happier. So again, this is Seven Keys to Surviving the Trump Presidency, Dr. Calm's Prescription for Healing Post-Election Stress by Dr. Kiran Dintiala. Ah, oh, yes, Brent, my darling, over to you. Well, there are certainly a lot of interesting choice, uh, synchronicities going on in our choices today because to pick up on some of those themes, my next film is a new documentary from filmmaker Matt Davila known as Minimalism, a documentary about the important things. Uh, and uh -huh. in this movie, uh, it's interesting where he discusses that in an age of conspicuous compulsory consumerism where seemingly all material needs can be met on a whim, it seems counterintuitive that so many of us would feel so unfulfilled by that. And ironically, the solution may rest with deliberately getting by with less. And he profiles that through the experiences of leaders in the minimalist movement, minimalist movement specifically authors Ryan Nicodemus and Joshua Fields Milburn. And their experiences are punctuated by commentary from a number of uh, different kinds of professionals, such as architects and sociologists, journalists, and so forth. And, and they all show how lifestyle changes involving living arrangements, purchasing habits, work routines, uh, and financial expectations can pay enormous benefits in areas like personal well-being, physical health, fiscal resource management, environmental sustain, uh, sustainability, and social interaction. Uh, for example, by not having to worry about having enough money to, to protect all of your stuff, you can basically work less and spend more time doing mm -hmm. things that you enjoy. So it's a really interesting idea about how people have been able to attain mm -hmm. a certain degree of happiness that they couldn't have when they were basically chasing their, um, you know, the gods of materialism. Uh, for those who feel hopeless, despondent, or disempowered by their current circumstances, they may find that this scaled-down way of life could be just a ticket. Um, and the film offers a number of very practical applications that people can pursue to do this. 
everything from how to restyle your wardrobe to get by with less to the tiny house movement. Um, so this is really a, a wonderful and very succinct, uh, very uh, tautly written and tautly filmed um, production. It's available on DVD and video on demand. And, um, you know, it gives an excellent overview of a growing movement that could be the, proved to be the salvation of not only our society but the planet itself. Once again, mm -hmm. that's called Minimalism, a documentary about the important things from filmmaker Matt Davila. I actually have a friend who sold up everything. They sold their business and built a tiny house, and now they're living on the Oregon coast, happy as a clam. I love watching the um, television show on the construction channels about the tiny house movement. It's really wonderful to see people just consciously opting to live with less so that they can enjoy life more, so that they can um, you know, travel and, and have leisure and spend time with their family and children. So I definitely uh, think that this is an idea uh, very worth pursuing. In, you, you don't have to move into a tiny house, but the idea of minimalism, we don't need stuff to make us happy. We keep on looking outside of ourselves instead of inside. We think that the, the latest... Um, gadget or or television or whatever is what we need to make us happy and we're chasing our tails. Well, it's so. interesting because the minimalists are putting forth the idea too that that following this this train of thought doesn't mean necessarily getting rid of everything. If you have things that are meaningful and valuable to you, say like a book collection, keep it. Just get rid of the exactly. other stuff you don't need. Exactly. Focus on what's important to you. Yeah. Okay, well, there's another break. We will be back with Cynthia Sue Larson and Brent Marchant. I'm Miriam Knight. We are the reviewers in your Reviewers Roundtable. Free your mind with Ohm Times Radio, IOM FM. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site, but a spiritual dating site with a purpose to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free, ascendinghearts.com. Grab a cup of tea or a glass of wine and tune in for inspired conversations with publisher Linda Joy on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Linda creates sacred space for leading female luminaries, empowering authors, heart-centered female entrepreneurs, coaches, and healers. A soulful venue where guests openly share the fears and obstacles they've overcome, wisdom and lessons learned, and the personal journey that led them to the transformational work they do in the world. Inspired conversations to empower you on your path to authentic, soulful living. Sparky the Fire Dog here. Make sure your family has a fire escape plan, and they practice it twice a year. One important thing to practice is get low and go. If you see or smell smoke, it's important to get low and go. Protect your family from fire. For more information, visit sparky.org. We want to keep you, your family, and your community safer from fire. This message brought to you by the National Fire Protection Association and your local fire department. Visit sparky.org. Welcome back to our Reviewers Roundtable with Cynthia Sue Larson and Brent Marchand. Um, Cynthia, I think it's your turn. Yes, thank you. Well, my next book is a beautiful uh, revised edition of a book that was published a couple decades ago, but I find it every bit as current now as it was when it came out, and I think a lot of people agree because there is a new forward, and the book is called The Embodied Mind, Cognitive Science and Human Experience, and it's written by Francisco J. Varela, Evan Thompson, and Eleanor Roche. And this book provides what I consider to be a really excellent introduction to this field of embodied cognition 
that has taken off in large part due to this very book. And it's published by MIT Press. And obviously, it's been well received and respected by scholars in many different fields since it first came out. This new edition is amazing because it contains a classic book, which was first published in 1991, that first proposed this idea that originally came out of Buddhist practices as well as science, claiming that we have something called embodied cognition. The idea here is uh, that, for example, when the Buddhists experience what they call uh, this experience of nothingness, it's often misunderstood by Westerners because it seems like it's threatening. It, it can't be grasped. You can't hold on to it. It doesn't really exist, but it also doesn't not exist. It's, it's, it's um, something that can't be seen, heard, or thought. And when the conceptual mind tries to grasp it, it finds nothing. So it's experienced as emptiness. But this however, is really Buddha nature. It's no mind, primordial mind, absolute bodhicitta, wisdom mind, warrior's mind, all goodness, great perfection, naturalness. So this gives you an idea of the main concept, but what I love about it is that this book is about the best thing for reading to get the appreciation of the philosophy and approach behind one of the most exciting advances in psychology that I've seen in a long time, all about the embodied mind approach so that you can actually do something, like strike a power pose, for example, as Amy Cuddy has popularized recently, and you will be boosting a lot of your uh, good, uh, helpful hormones in your body while reducing the stress hormones. So that's where the science has gone since this book came out. This book itself proposes reconceptualizing intentionality of cognition as an action, and that's this this idea that, that that there's a history of structural coupling that brings forth a world in a process of natural drift and across a network consisting of multiple levels of interconnected sensory motor sub networks. Okay, I know that sounds complicated, but the big yeah. idea here is <laughs> that basically, yeah, it's just like you can't um, separate an organism from the environment. Then, for example, the colors of flowers co-evolved at the same time as bees, honeybees, evolved their ability to see into ultraviolet. It was simultaneous biological transformation, which makes no mm -hmm. sense if you're using sort of the old way of looking at things, but this is very new, um, new and old at the same time. The science, our science, our Western science is starting to come on board with these very ancient Buddhist concepts. And so the, I love the way the book interweaves the science and the Buddhist principles throughout. And I love the, the introduction that Eleanor Roche was one of the co-authors. Um, she also wrote the fabulous introduction this time to appreciate how much things have changed in the last 25 years. So this book is more relevant than ever before because it does cons clarify the concept of inaction so that we can see how to build a bridge of understanding to a mode of knowing where we are present and available. Again, we've been talking about these themes today because that, we, that came up with surviving Trump. And uh, also, in this book, Roche makes the brilliant points with regard to the future of inaction as an approach to cognitive science. Because for real dialogue to occur, everybody involved needs to speak and be heard equally. And this is part of that embodiment of this idea. So it's um, recognizing that science can't just take over like a colonial ruler, because that would be imperialism, not dialogue. And we, instead of that sort of thing, we need to maintain goodwill and dialogue and listening. And I just love the chapter on selfless minds. I'll say one more thing about this, because it made the point in our modern Western society, we often believe freedom is the ability to do whatever we want. But actually... In this book, it presents the idea of codependent origination, where doing whatever one wants out of a sense of ego, which is volitional action, according to the system, is the least free of actions because it's chained to the past by cycles of conditioning and results in further enslavement to habitual patterns in the future. So I'll leave you with that thought. It, this book is amazing, though. If you love artificial intelligence, believe it or not, it delves heavily into that field with robotics and what used to be called cybernetics. 
So I just can't recommend this book highly enough. It's The Embodied Mind, Cognitive Science, and Human Experience by Francisco Varela, Evan Thompson, and Eleanor Roche. I have to admit that that was pretty um, deep. Uh, can you give us kind of a, a, how would you describe freedom in, tr in terms of that book, in sort of layman's terms? Okay, that's a good question. Yeah, so freedom then would be uh, being more present in the moment instead of, um, instead of kind of going on autopilot where you assume, I'm a Democrat, I do what Democrats do, or I'm a tiny house person, or I'm a Mercedes owner. I'm not picking on anyone here. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you might be all those things. Okay, uh, but, but when we start labeling ourselves and we seem to often go on autopilot and we move through life that way, we can get into arguments with loved ones, which are pointless. And if we had just actually been in that moment, you've often heard of meditation helping people become mindful. What that really means is you gain the freedom of noticing, like, wow, the sun is shining. There's a nice warm breeze. And suddenly you're not worried about paying taxes or what Trump did today or whatever. You know, you can tune out all that, and you're just in this amazing moment. And even if your friend says something and brings up an upsetting subject, you can notice, but they are speaking with their heart. And you can be more there and more aware instead of acting out of reactions and just sort of knee-jerk responses based on habit and past conditioning. That's what it's all about. So free, free will then becomes um, you are not described or defined by what even people think you are, but you're just in that moment, fully present, fully sensing, intuiting, listening, seeing. So you're not buried in your cell phone or something, but you're just really there. And that's, I think that's the best way for me to quickly summarize it. I know that took a while, but it's a big idea. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that this is a cue for Brent to talk about Keddy. <laughs> yes, that's certainly at the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of uh, <laughs> the level of how profound it is. Uh, Keddy is a, a new film that's a, a documentary about the street cats of Istanbul. Now, ordinarily, this is not the kind of movie I would probably review, except for the fact that it really is more than just an extended cat video, which is what something that I think a lot of people might want to label it as. It shows how that there's this long-lasting or long-standing tradition of interrelationships between the residents of the city and the street cats who live there. They get along really well. Uh, everybody sort of pitches in as uh, de facto caretakers for these cats. And uh, they've developed a very interesting rapport all through many years about uh, showing levels of care and compassion and, and even their own form of communication that really crosses species lines. And that's really, I think, very encouraging for us as a species because it shows that, you know, if we can do that with another species of animal, we can certainly do it with ourselves if we put our minds to it. <laughs> Um, it's a, a beautifully filmed movie, shows wonderful footage of the city itself, has some very interesting conversations and interviews with the people who are the caretakers, uh, and of course the cats are just adorable for you know to no end. Uh, they focus on seven cats in particular, but they have you know footage of other animals on the street as well. And um, you know I think cat lovers are probably going to be the ones who like it the most. But you know if you like good cinema really not caring about the content, I think you'll find a lot of interesting insights coming out of this one as well. Uh, this is well, currently I was fascinated. In yeah, yeah it, I was it, fascinated at how they actually followed these cats moving at speed at cat level. Yes. I was trying to figure out how they did that. And, and, the, and the clarity of the cinematography, I mean, getting down up close so you can see the individual strands of fur in the animal's faces is just stunning. What I found most interesting is I saw this in a the theater on a Sunday afternoon, it was 750 seats, and it was nearly sold out. Now, to mm -hmm. me, that's really encouraging in the fact that there's audiences out there for material that involve movies without explosions and without stupid jokes. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I think that this is really a, a real charmer. It's not really long. I think it's about an hour and 20 minutes. 
but it's a, it's a nice way to spend an afternoon and to see some cute pictures and you know you'll get your fill of awes before time is up. <laughs> but you know the reason I said uh, over to you, Brent, was because you look at the lives of these cats and also how the people interact, and they really are living in the moment. They really um, are, and it, and, and yeah. it's a. It, 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 and it's really a very good example that we can draw upon for learning how, uh, for how we can learn to get along with our fellow humans. You know, if we mm -hmm. can show that kind of care and compassion and concern for these street animals, why can't we do the same thing for our fellow humans? <laughs> Big question. Big question. It really is um, beautifully done, and you you just... Immerse yourself in the film. You immerse yourself in the life of the people, how they interact with the cats. Um, there, there was one story of, of a, a cat who was, they, they dubbed it the psychopath. Yeah. And it was, <laughs> uh, she was very, uh, you know, very jealous of her territory, of her mate. Uh, she did not treat her mate very well, but boy, let any other female cat approach her mate, and that cat knew about it. Yeah, it was and, definitely a case and... of the fur flying. <laughs> 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 and and also there was one um, one guy who um, uh, told the story of having lost his boat and really being kind of down and out. And a cat insisted that he, uh, he follow the cat and he found a wallet full of money that changed his life. So there really was a, a, almost a mystical connection among them. They have a wisdom all so, their own. They do, so thank you. That was Keddy, K-E-D-I. We will be back with our final segment, Reviewers Roundtable, stay with us. the best of the conscious minds in the world. Home Times Radio, your conscious lifestyle on steroids. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. Om Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single Om Times endeavor. Host your show with Om Times Radio Network. Hello, I'm Lisa Berry. Join me every Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for Light on Living, a chance to see new, hear different, and feel more as I shine the spotlight on all the ways to lighten the load of life's challenges. Light on Living is your link to that new way you're looking for, that new understanding that will enhance your life, and that positive connection that will support your growth. So join me and you'll gain insight and start to see things in a new way that motivates you. Today, my new dad threw a barbecue. I burnt everything. And then we played catch. I broke Mr. Lewis's window. And then, somehow, my hand. My hand! And then my dad even let me drive his car. The hospital's on the right! It was a rough day. It was a great day. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. For more information on how you can adopt, visit AdoptUSKids.org. A public service announcement from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt US Kids, and the Ad Council. <laughs> Welcome back. We have Cynthia Sue Larson, Brent Marchant, and I'm Miriam Knight for the Reviewers Roundtable. Well, my final book is called Medical Medium, Life-Changing Foods, Save Yourself and the Ones You Love with the Hidden Healing Powers of Fruits and Vegetables by Anthony William. Now, I interviewed Anthony oh, over a year ago when he came out with his first book called Medical Medium which was absolutely fascinating because he told uh, he is a medium and he channels medical information that is goes way beyond what either conventional or alternative uh, many alternative health practitioners accept as 
common wisdom. Um, Anthony uh, speaks of having been trained by spirit since childhood when spirit took him to graveyards and had him focus on the people beneath his feet and say, okay, what did this one die of? What did that one die of? And he kind of got anatomy and physiology lessons in this rather unusual setting. Now, fast forward to today because what he focuses on is an expansion of his first book, focusing on the foods that should be our medicine. And he speaks of the holy four life-changing foods. And they include fruits, vegetables, herbs and spices, and then wild foods. And he really is a big fan, uh, not a fan, I, I mean a, a passionate advocate for eating foods fresh, steamed, in, in whatever form that you can get them from these holy four uh, food categories because they have the most amazing life-enhancing qualities. And I think if most of us focus on our own diets, um, they probably are sadly lacking in the bounty that nature has for us. He talks about eating as close to nature as possible. He talks about taking foods, these foods into your hand. The best thing is to grow them organically yourself. But if you can't, take clean, uh, preferably organic food, hold them in your hand and sort of bond with them. Let them rise to your level of vibration. I know it sounds woo woo, but I guess it's kind of like blessing the food that you're eating. Um, he talks about the foods. With each food, um, he gives you a um, description of the food and its qualities. Then the conditions that, if you have, uh, could be helped by this food. So, for example, if you have heart disease, um, uh, HIV, kidney disease, brain uh, disease, Crohn's, fatigue syndrome, uh, and any diseases affecting the nervous system, he's recommending that you eat avocados um, because they have really, really good fats. Um, he also talks about the symptoms that can be helped by avocados, the spiritual lessons and the emotional support that you can get from the fruit and then he gives a recipe using that particular fruit, vegetable, or herb. So it's not a cookbook. It's this mishmash of, of uh, spiritual wisdom, um, physiological uh, information, and absolutely delicious and fantastic recipes. I've tried a few, and they're really amazingly good. Um, the last part of the book, uh, like his first book, um, talks about um, the future of uh, uh, our health and how harmful health fads and trends could be um, misconstrued and be wasting our time. I, I'll give you just one example. Um, we talk about uh, oil pulling with coconut oil. And he said that you can oil pull until the cows come home and it's not going to do you much good. But coconut oil does have antiviral, antifungal um, properties. So the best way to use it is to put, after you've brushed your teeth and rinsed out, is to put some oil, coconut oil, on your toothbrush and then use that to clean your teeth and gums. And that it will have the best effect. He talks about things like um, commonly accepted homeopathic remedies and flower remedies that are made with alcohol. And he suggests that most of these are made with alcohol derived from GMO tainted corn. And so that could be actually diminishing the benefits that we want to bring into our lives. 
uh, with these with these substances. Foods that make life challenging, he talks about dairy products and eggs and um, uh, that they could be counterproductive if we have uh, certain conditions that he details. So the book, I guess, is one of these books that you have to be discerning as to how you resonate with it. Um, personally, I resonate very strongly and I really recommend looking into it. Again, it's called Medical Medium, Life-Changing Foods, Save Yourself and the Ones You Love with the Hidden Healing Powers of Fruits and Vegetables by Anthony William. It's a beautiful book that just came out from Hay House. Oh, Brent, you have another movie for us, don't you? I sure do. <clears throat> and this is the... Uh... Uh, this is the, the film that's uh, currently the featured review in the latest edition of New Consciousness Review. It's a very interesting metaphysical drama from director Sunil Shah titled The Wisdom Tree. And what starts out as like a seemingly straightforward accident investigation and quickly escalates into an exploration of life's deeper issues, probing matters such as uh, the fundamental nature of existence. Uh, that's accomplished through an interesting interweaving of stories involving a neuroscientist, a quantum physicist, and an FBI agent. And it sounds their... like the beginning of a joke. <laughs> yeah, I know, exactly. <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> uh, but it, it's interesting the way they, <clears throat> they're, they, they're, um, they have very synchronistic interactions with one another that end up... Um, taking viewers into some very deep questions related to things like the building blocks of reality and the state of human evolution uh, and also uh, examining how the questions of science and spirit are not necessarily as antagonistic to one another as, might, as one might think, that they're actually more like two sides of the same coin. Um, one of the things in particular that I liked about this movie was the fact that it, it – in approaching its subject matter, it wove together the philosophical concepts into the main narrative without being obvious or awkward or intrusive, as happens in so many movies in, in this, this genre. Uh, it gets a point, its points across by um, not interrupting the flow of the story or becoming bogged down in a lot of jargon or vague platitudes. Uh, it's a very, it walks a very fine line in terms of the way it does that, and it does it really quite well. So. I recommend it highly for anybody who's, you know, looking for answers to their own path in life. Um, and even though it's a work of fiction, it, it still provides beautifully illustrated examples for understanding that there's a lot more to reality than what we see before our eyes, uh, that we are multidimensional creatures who are living rich and diverse lives far beyond anything we can possibly imagine and that we just happen to see based on, you know, the uh, what we perceive with our five uh, outside senses. Um, mm -hmm. Terrific movie in many ways, recommended very highly. Um, the kind of movie that's a really good thing to, to sit down with and watch, like on a rainy Saturday afternoon, so you can soak up the information that it has to impart. And uh, it's available on DVD and Blu-ray disc. And once again, it's titled The Wisdom Tree by Sunil Shah. You said even though it's a work of fiction, you know, most of the books that I get to read are nonfiction. And so when I do get a fiction book, it's almost like a, uh, a, a guilty pleasure, a treat. Um, and in the case of the, one of the books that I reviewed today, the book about the albino children um, called uh, Then She Was Born, born. Um, it, fiction and poetry as well are able to convey the emotion behind the situation in a way that nonfiction can't. So it's a very powerful additional dimension to the great questions that we deal with as human beings. So that's why I guess I really um, so resonate and, and well, really that, well that's it. very true particularly in this case you know if, if you were to sit down and, and 
look at some of the concepts that it talks about in a purely nonfiction context, you know, you might end up falling asleep <laughs> pretty quickly. <laughs> but, but by working it into a fictional context, it gives it a certain relevance, and it brings it home to the viewer in a way that a purely nonfiction offering can't do. Right, absolutely. Cynthia, give us a, a plug for whatever you're up to today. Okay, well, I'm working on uh, the quantum paradigm, so I'm working on a new project with a physicist who is one of the hippies who saved physics by the book of that name, so it is related to a book. And we're just starting the process of putting that together. So it's in the works. And it has to do with uh, the way that we actually think about all of reality. And I love what Brent just said, that if, if you're watching a movie, if you're reading fiction, then you can really enjoy the whole experience. And it, uh, there's something about story that sinks in deeply. And I just mm -hmm. love that. Mm. Well, that's our show for today. We have been graced by Cynthia Sue Larson and Brent Marchand. I'm Miriam Knight. This has been your Reviewers Roundtable for New Consciousness Review at ncreview.com. Uh, the new spring issue of the magazine is out, so go to our website and read it. It's chock full of fascinating articles and interviews and reviews. Many blessings to you. Join us next week. Goodbye for now.